Hello, welcome to DanceWise, releasing trauma through movement and expressive arts. Today, I'm going to be talking to Jenny Dupree, who's truly one of the wise elders. Jenny is the founder of the Naskaya Movement Arts Centre in New Hampshire. Aha, got it. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. <laughs> Hello, Venetia. <laughs> Uh, well, this is fantastic to talk to you because I'm sure there's many people who are going to be watching this who are well aware of the wonderful work the Naskaya Movement, Movement Art Centre is doing, but maybe not everyone is aware of you, or well, they may know your name, but they may not be aware of who you are because you now are in a retirement um, yes. um, community, community um, about an hour away from Naskaya, so you're not able to pop down like you used to and yep. you're no, no longer teaching so I think it's wonderful that you're here to talk about the story of Naskaya and what inspired you because you're a real good really good example of someone who managed to turn early childhood trauma into the lotus of wonderful possibilities not only for yourself your own healing but for the wider community and I think that is a really inspiring um, story because it shows people that however difficult their early life or later trauma, there's always a nugget which mm. can be transformed into, the, into something positive for not only necessarily an ind the individual, but the wider community. So I think that's really inspiring. So um, let's begin the story and perhaps you can uh, Tell everyone how Naskaya became Naskaya. Well, <laughs> um, at the time I was married to Dana Johnson, who was an Aikido teacher. And I, I started actually, when I moved to Franconia, I started teaching folk dance. And then I heard of sacred circle dance. And I said, sacred circle dance, what's that? So I went. Um, to Danville, where they were doing sacred circle dance um, to celebrate the fall equinox during the Dowsers convention. And I got there and they were doing dances I already knew with a candle in the center. And it was like, well, of course I knew that. Um, so actually it gave me a very good start as a dance teacher because I was already teaching folk dance. So adding the sacred dimension was very easy. <laughs> um, so then, let me see, I think that was in 88. Um, no, it wasn't that long afterward. Um, we, we used to joke because my husband was teaching Aikido in a school gym and I was teaching uh, sacred dance in the elementary school gym, which was actually a, a pretty beautiful room, but it was a gym. <laughs> So we, we would joke, we would say, what this town needs, a, needs is a dance hall dojo. Dojo is where you do martial arts. Um, and then I went to see my cousin Lydia and she had built herself a dance studio in a, a barn on their property. And it was a, a, a regulation dance studio with mirrors and a bar and the rest of it. Well, I didn't want that <laughs> for my sacred dance. I wanted a sacred space. But uh, I was filled with the energy of jealousy and I came home to Dana and said, let's do it, let's build it. So we did. Little did I know <laughs> what I was getting into. Uh, and, it was, uh, oh, go ahead. And, in the, and as what I was gonna say, it was, and it wasn't just any old building, was it? It was, it was built according to the principles of sacred geometry to create that sacred space. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very, very different sort of building. <laughs> All you have to do is think about hyperbolic paraboloids. 
Could you tell us what hyperbolic are? Well, I, I wish I had um, something to describe it with, but but uh, what you need is a square of something flexible, square, and then you bend two of the corners down and you bend the other two up. And so between the upward corners, you get a saddle curve and between the downward corners, you get a, I don't know what to call it, a mountain curve. Um, so it's curved in two directions. And, um, and the, the, the fabric has to stretch when you move it like that. So it's a, um, a very unusual shape. And we discovered it has great acoustical properties. Um, but it was, it, was, uh, it was quite a job. <laughs> it took us several years. And, and what was the inspiration to um, have it? Is it 12, 12 sides? But Oh, the, well, the 12 sides. Uh, Dana thought this up. Um, it's, it's 12 sides. No, it's based, the dance floor is 12 sides, but the building itself is only eight sides. And what you have to do is um, create uh, a 12-sided figure, kind of like the Zodiac, and cut it in quarters. And then you have, in each quarter, you have the first side and the third side, and you extend them out until they join. So you get a shape that's, uh, it's not a regular octagon. Um, it's a little bit different. And, uh, and Dana designed it that way because he wanted the hyperbolic paraboloid roof to come down to a point at this point and to be up in a, gee, do we have a picture of Neskaya we could show or have people seen it? No, I, um, I'll put a picture on. And then the, the, um, the curves that go up go over the like the the uh, the west entrance <laughs> it is rather hard to describe <clears throat> but it is a very magical building and um and uh, the way we got the name um, when we applied for a building permit they they described it as a fitness center and we said it is not a fitness center and one of us said let's call it after a tower on dark over and the other one said neskaya Boom, that was it. No question, this building was to be called Neskaya. It practically told us. Mm. Um, and Dark Over is Marion Zimmer Bradley's uh, science fiction planet. Um, her stories about it are quite interesting because she, um, she does them from different ages and different things have happened with the history. She, just, she doesn't care if she's writing this to fit in with an earlier book. She just writes... Um, actually, it turns out that her dark over stories were like um, opening sketches for the Mists of Avalon. Do you know the Mists of Avalon? The Mists of Avalon used to be my favorite book. Yes. Well, that's Marion Zimmer Bradley. And before she wrote the Mists of Avalon, she wrote all the stuff about dark over. So on, on dark over, uh, people with psychic powers work together in buildings. They're called towers. Um, and the people work in circles. And of course, here we are doing sacred circle dance. I mean, it's just, you know, what could be better? Mm. Um, so, and we, we wrote her a letter and said, um, is it okay if we use the name Neskaya? And, and we, we actually gave her a, a fill out the blanks letter to write back to us. <laughs> so, and a, and a self-addressed stamped envelope to make it easy. So she, um, uh, she said, yes, that's fine with me and mm. signed her name. And we were going to frame it, <laughs> never got around to it. So it's in a file folder somewhere waiting. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. And um, I also read on your blog, I mean, so many interesting things you say uh -huh. on your blog um, that um, you felt like the presence of the ancestors throughout the. Well, I feel the ancestors when we do the old folk dances. I, I have this sense of circles of people going back literally thousands of years. I mean, people have been doing those dances for a long, long time. Um, and actually I realized more recently that the folk dances are indigenous mm. because they come out of the land and they were certainly first created by the people living there who'd been living there for a long time. So um, mm. yeah. And I imagine in those early, I mean, I've just, 
talking off the top of my head, but I, I imagine that those early people, even before communities were properly formed, that they were so in tune with the energy of the land and the spirals and the, the waves and the energy that they would have moved their bodies quite instinctively and naturally in those movements across the land. And maybe that's before they became formal dancers. I don't know, but it was- well, yeah, that's it's interesting. It's certainly possible. Um, a, another thing that amuses me is, is in England, there are all the, all the stone circles. Hmm. And there are frequently stories about a group of women dancing on the solstice and being turned into stone because they were committing a terrible sin. Uh, but I think it's just a memory of when people used to dance inside the circles. Mm, mm. It's a space to dance. Um, I, I know people who have, have, seen, have seen beings, if you like to call it that, um, in, within the circles of mm. the stones. Um, you know, that, that energy is still very potent and um, it's like a portal. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's not, it's real. <laughs> um, and interesting also was you, your, your innate, you, you know, you felt like a big joint to the um, Celtic. Lineage. Oh, yes. Well, that, that's my own background, my own indigenous background, Scots and Irish. And, and I had always envied the Greeks and the Israelis, their wonderful folk dances. And, uh, and the, the first time I went to folk dance in Brunswick, somebody brought in an album and she taught us a uh, simple dance. <clears throat> and then when she put the music on, it was bagpipes. <laughs> and I went immediately to Scotland, which actually it wasn't Scotland, it was Brittany. I'd never heard of Brittany. I didn't know it was a Celtic country. Um, it was the music of Alan Stavell who plays the Celtic harp. Uh, which is that's great stuff mm. <laughs> so um yeah so then my my celtic soul rose up and said it's about time <laughs> <laughs> this is your dance so and that was that was before i'd heard of sacred circle dance mm. so what year are we talking now in the eight in the eight um, let's see um i moved to brunswick in 75 mm -hmm. So that was before Sacred Circle Dance even existed. But I, but I had done folk dance in Paris in 1964, which is the year I graduated with a degree in astronomy. Oh, you got a degree in astronomy? Yeah. Yes, and the universe sent me to Stonehenge, very, very cleverly choreographed. <laughs> so you really are bridging heaven and earth with, yeah. with your, your life's work and bring, bringing that we probably, yeah, the ancient astronomers bringing that wisdom down mm. uh, into embodiment. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, because we could talk a lot about that. <laughs> um, so now, the, the the dancing you said in Paris, which introduced you to the um, Greek mm -hmm. dances, and that resonated with you. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you still, at that point, hadn't tapped into the fact that you you know you hadn't been aware of it that actually early childhood trauma was you know had, had created a, a um I always yeah, I, I like to call them I, form of glitches I like to call them glitches yeah. I, I I don't I don't know I don't feel like I don't feel like trauma led me to folk dance I feel like that was my um my vocation my my purpose in coming to earth this time um maybe my, I don't know what to call it, my higher self, my oversoul, knew that trauma and dance could, could work together. Um, in fact, I don't know if you read the, the piece about how Neskaya, um, no, I should say Francis Weller talks about the difference between initiation and trauma. And they both start the same way where you get separated from your old identity and uh, brought into a liminal world where you know all the boundaries are kind of fluid and if you if you don't have um, an initiation ceremony then you're kind of stuck there mm -hmm. um, if you do have an initiation ceremony you come out into a wider world mm -hmm. and what what makes initiation possible is and and he says the the space um, the 
ancestors, which my sense are the dancers who danced, you know, for thousands of years, the elders who are the elders of the tribe. And I think of somebody like Bernard Vosian or Laura Shannon, who are people who discovered the dances and handed them down to us. Um, and then, and then ceremony and ritual. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what, when I teach sacred circle dance, I mean, I, I, you know, start by lighting the candles and calling the spirits. <laughs> um, so, so I, I do ceremony whenever I do a, a sacred circle dance evening of two hours. Um, yeah. So we've got, it's all right there at Niskaya. Mm -hmm. and, and you were teaching at Niskaya until recently, was that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And when, when did you stop that? Did you went did you retired? Well, it was, um, it actually was after I moved here, I had thought I would be able to go back every other week. What happened was, and my therapist said, she said, you are beyond the end of your resources. Hmm. You have to rest. <laughs> and of course, downsizing and moving is a lot of work. And hmm. I just ended up being so tired that the drive back simply cost too much and I couldn't do it, which was a great disappointment. I mean, I, I felt like I really lost something. Um, you know, fortunately I found a supportive community here um, in the sense of the basics, having people around all the time and having meals taken care of. I've always been food challenged for some reason. I don't know if it goes back to the trauma, I, who knows? It's, early trauma is mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, Would you like to, to talk a bit about um, that early trauma and how that uh, not well, only the, also how it helped you with the dance or rather how the dance released it? Um, boy, let's see. Well, my, my understanding of what happened to me is that I was left alone too often and too long uh, I think people don't realize that a baby can be that easily traumatized. I certainly thought, I thought trauma had to have a violent thing happen. Um, and my parents were, were alcoholics, but they weren't violent. I was never hit. So, um, so I didn't see how I could be traumatized until I learned that uh, trauma, trauma results when uh, your system, meaning your brain and nervous system, when an event happens that overwhelms your brain and nervous system and you can't process it. It's a bit like not being able to digest food. And then you end up having undigested food in your system, which isn't, isn't good for you. <laughs> um, so, and if you're a baby, what happens is if you're, if you're left alone and your parent, no one comes back. If no one comes to feed you, you will die. Mm -hmm. And the moment your reptilian brainstem concludes that you will die is when you en or enter into the realm of trauma. And a baby can't fight and it can't flee. So I think people are now beginning to learn that, that um, it isn't just fight or flight, that there's also freeze. If you, can't, if you can't flee and you can't fight, then you freeze. Yeah. So I went into freeze. Um, and I think that's, that created a long-standing severe depression, mm -hmm. uh, which is why when I finally got on medication for depression and I got to normal brain chemistry, it was like, what's this? I've never felt like this, um, which is quite a statement, but even that didn't didn't say anything about trauma mm -hmm. so um it, it was a, a friend and she had grown up in a in a horribly abusive and violent family and and she's still struggling with multiple trauma um because she's she didn't have family money i was lucky i had family money um yeah so she's she's stuck on the welfare system and and um uh therapists who will take insurance and the good ones don't have to take insurance some of them have sliding scales but uh, so I was lucky um so let me see how did I get there <laughs> oh it was reading Peter Levine's book called Waking the Tiger where he he describes what creates trauma and um 
and that's when I that's when I realized. Um, yeah. And how old were you when when you suddenly realized that the I was in my late fifties. Oh, in your fifties. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. So you yeah. at that point you were completely but, unaware that you'd been traumatized. Right. And it, and it really took Peter Levine's book. And so then I started doing somatic experiencing, which is the method of healing that he developed, partly from observing animals, because trauma is held in the body. Yeah, well, and shake yeah, shake it off, literally, because he has pictures. I, I actually did some of the training, and then I wasn't able to keep going. But um, he showed a picture. I think it's a possum. It's not playing possum. It's actually in freeze. and the coyote comes up and noses it and it's clearly immobile. So the coyote decides it's dead and walks away. And then the possum shakes itself off and walks away. And yeah. It's, yeah, it's the most, but that's because when your system goes into fight or flight, a tremendous amount of energy builds up. And if you actually do fight or flee and survive, um, apparently you can be exhausted for three days afterward. So it's a lot of energy that builds up. And if you don't fight or flee, then that energy is trapped in the body. And that's what creates the symptoms. Mm. Your body is constantly trying to complete the gesture of running away. <laughs> um, mm. So that's interesting stuff. So doing somatic experiencing made a difference. So then I thought, okay. <laughs> If this is supposed to help with trauma, then I must have been traumatized. Um, and, and I deduced that I was left alone too long, partly because, and especially, I mean, this is where COVID has been terrible for me because of the social distancing. Mm. And I think actually I'm, I'm really, Bessel van der Kolk, who is a trauma expert, says that what heals is touch, rhythm, and movement. And you think that's, that's what a mother does, rocking her baby. Actually, another interesting thing I found out is a baby can't regulate its nervous system. If your nervous system goes up, if it gets excited, you can't bring it down by yourself. You need your caretaker to comfort you thousands of times before you learn mm -hmm. to do it. So that's that's something else I didn't know. And my mother was not, <laughs> not the sort who knew how to comfort a baby. Mm. And I think with the wartime generation. Yes, that, that too. That, so another, um, yeah, I mean, she was all by herself. My, my father was overseas fighting a war when she gave birth to me. So that had to have been hard. I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for her. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. So let's see, where was I going? So I was, um, I've just been thinking about, um, I, went, I went back to Neskaya, I think it was in October because a good friend who had moved away was gonna be around and she was gonna dance with us and I wanted to see her, so I went. And, um, and we were dancing inside the building and I said, I want to hold hands. I said, be, and we can use hand sanitizer. Of course, it did get us closer than the recommended distance. But, and I said, anybody who doesn't want to hold hands, that's okay. But we all held hands um, and did the dances. And then just a week ago, I went again um, and we didn't hold hands. We stayed socially distanced. Now, the, when I went in October, I came back feeling wonderful. Um, last Sunday, I came back feeling vaguely disappointed and not, I think it was partly because there were some new people there. But when I think about it, and I, and I think about Vander Kolk talking about the importance of touch. I mean, we do need to be with people in the body for our nervous systems to regulate by, by resonance. But maybe, especially for trauma, maybe touch is, is more important than we realize. Um, so, you know, I've just been thinking about that and wondering. I know that I would often go in to teach a session on, on Sunday evening feeling depressed, but I would start teaching and two hours later, I'd feel great. Mm. So obviously the teaching was doing something for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know quite what to make of all of that. But. Well, I think, you know, the, the um, 
stress and the mental health after lockdown and particularly the isolation it, it's just criminal what yes yes and it brings me back really to what you were saying earlier my take of the whole episode was a collective initiation for the human race really <laughs> yeah and um yes but then we need the ceremony and then but and to move beyond that uh, it, it's yeah. not a case of just oh everything's back to normal it, it, to recognize what actually happened on on yeah. in, individually well, and, and, and um, normal normal was never healthy yeah or at least not our normal mm. yeah so um and i did see that you said that Naskaya was a container for initiation yeah. which i like yeah. that idea yeah. um um Yes, and I wrote down what, what, what you said. It was, as we were building the Skya, every time I drove through Franconia Notch, I prayed to the spirits of the Notch to help us build a building that would raise the consciousness of everyone who entered it. When the foundation was being poured, I sat on the hill above and chanted to Kanzian, the Bodhisattva of compassion. Yep. So I thought that. Yep. Yep, yeah. it was there. <laughs> And um, so could you tell me a little bit about that presence and, oh, and gosh, how well, that ties into this initiation chamber? I mean, <laughs> it sounds yeah. like something out of the Great Pyramid, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Initiation ch ch chamber. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I, um, I got interested in Buddhism. Actually, I was, this was uh, my first winter. I'd come back from California um, after a, uh, a romance that broke up rather disastrously. And uh, I always felt more at home in New England. So I came back to Portland, Maine and I was severely depressed. I mean, I knew I was somewhat depressed but I was actually in a, in a severe depression. And my brother came and he said to me, Buddha says life is suffering. And I felt like I hit bottom. I felt like I had been floundering and boom, life is suffering. Um, so I, I said, tell me more about this Buddha. So he was getting involved with the Zen Center in Rochester. So I began to sit Zazen and travel to Rochester to do Sashin, which is um, a long, silent retreat. Uh, and it really helped a lot. And although there was more that helped, I think being, being among people doing a training program, I didn't realize how much I needed to be around people and not alone so much. And I'm sure the meditation helped. Um, and that's where I learned the chant to Kanon, uh, which is what, let's see, the Bodhisattva of Compassion is called Avalokiteshvara in uh, India. And he's a man or a male bodhisattva, but bodhisattvas have no gender. Um, she is Chenrezig in Tibet, um, Kanon in Japan, uh, and Kuan Yin in China. But it's the same being. Hmm. So that's, I was chanting a chant I had learned in the Zen Center um, <clears throat> while they poured the foundation, while they, yeah, while they poured the, the floor. Hmm. And, and, we went back there afterward and, and felt a lot of energy in the floor. Um, at the time, I've gone back through my journal and checked out these notes. It's fascinating to me. And then I realized that we, I had a statue of the Bodhisattva, actually, that we had more than one. And it started out that Naskaya, there's a huge wall in the east um, facing the dance floor where we can hang paintings and, and uh, and large pieces of cloth and you know for it's for decoration um the entrance is to the west and the east wall is on the other side so so let's see i think the statue of the bodhisattva started on the south side of the east wall and then it moved around it, it went to the north side it went to the center it sat up on top of the east wall there were several different statues and then somehow it ended up on the north side of the east wall and it just stayed there. We, we didn't move it again. I don't know exactly why, but one year at summer solstice, the sun was setting and it shone through the northwest window right onto the Bodhisattva. 
So I said, oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> here we are, Stonehenge again, <laughs> the heel <laughs> stone. Um, so that seemed pretty special. So then at winter solstice, I checked again, um, and the winter solstice alignment isn't quite as um, striking, but when the sun is in the south, it shines through one of the high up south windows onto the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Mm -hmm. Well, excuse me, I think the building has been under the protection of the Bodhisattva of Compassion since the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't realize it, but there she was, or he. <laughs> mm, I, I, it, the energy of Kuan Yin, I love Kuan Yin. Um, mm. It's a very uh, pure. Yeah. Energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. So you've got the bodies at for there, and you've got the um, ancestors keeping yeah. guard. And I'm sure in the wilds of um, New Hampshire, <laughs> do you get um, you know a lot of wildlife in the grounds as well? Oh, uh, gee, you know I don't remember seeing a bear. Um, we did have bears visit us in our house in Franconia, and we had bears. Um, I had bears come to the house I built for myself, which is right across the road from Neskaya. Um, which was great because I could, you know, Neskaya was right across the street. Um, and moose, of course. Um, deer. Yeah. Because you, you, you did early on, you did spend some time in Findhorn, didn't you? When, um, yes, yes. But in the 80s again. When did I first go to Findhorn? I think it was, yeah, I think it was in the late 70s, actually. Right. Well, I'm, no, I know, well, it's funny not to be able to remember. <laughs> getting old, getting old. Because <laughs> that, that was like one of the first communities using different principles for growing things and. Right, right. It, wasn't it? No. You know, way, no. way before many other. Oh, I know. I think the first time I went was, was right after the change of the millennium. Now that I think of it, I did my first um, circle dance teacher training was with Peter Valens in Massachusetts. So, um, yeah, so that's I first. Well, I started teaching it almost right away, although I still called it folk dance. But I, I had the understanding that there was more here than just folk dances. Yeah, yes. So with your long, I won't call it career because that makes it sound a bit one dimensional but your rich life of dance and building the sky what key elements would you say were, were the the essence of you know oh the, gosh like, uh, is there any particular some things which which shine out beyond anything else or not, not can, really um the whole journey I yeah, and and the I one of actually I realized it. I mean, one of the things I used to do at Neskaya when we first opened it is I would change the hangings, uh, big big pieces of cloth hanging from the balcony, um, uh, eight times a year mm -hmm. for the the uh, the equinoxes, the solstices, and the cross quarter days. So we always celebrated those with appropriate dances. Um, I think. I always felt I was more of a pagan than a Christian anyway. Um, winter solstice has always been my, my most important holiday. Um, so yes, decorating the building was a big piece for me and, um, and creating ceremonies with the dances. I love doing that. And we started at some point, we started doing something we called all day dances. And people came and brought food and we literally danced all day. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, oh no, it must have been our first Moosemas. We also celebrated a holiday called Moosemas, which is absolutely hilarious. I think Moosemas. there's Moosemas. I think, um, <laughs> I, I think there's still a page on the Neskaya website that describes Moosemas. It was developed by a, a group of pagans um, who said that it, it could get very tiring you know, what with chanting and dancing and ceremony and all the rest of it. So 
so we declared that there had to be a, a holiday um, sacred to resting. <laughs> so they they uh, they named it after Bullwinkle the Moose. Oh. <laughs> and they said, and they talked about lounging around, you know, eating potato chips and and. Uh, I, I can't remember now what all they said, but it did sound like a lot of fun. So we declared our first Moosemas for the um, the Friday after Thanksgiving so as not to partake in, in the great American ritual of shopping. Oh. <laughs> I quite like the idea of a Moosemas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I yeah. It's yes, yes, called a slouching. I seem to remember yeah. a slouching. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was fun. Moosemas was fun. Yes. And... Uh... So um, to people listening, um, is there anything you'd like to, before we finish, you'd, you'd, you'd like to tell them that you would like to pass on, which can either help them on their journey or a pearl of, another pearl of wisdom? Gosh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Follow your heart. You know, sometimes I say that Naskaya is the most selfish thing I've ever done. <laughs> I built a playhouse and invited all my friends to come play with me. That was that was why I did it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to dance. And it, it was a place for my friends to come and dance with me, the kind of dance that was meaningful to me. And it's continuing. So, no, I, don't, I don't see it as a, as a big philanthropic gift to the world. I, I see it as my, yeah. <laughs> Now, how 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 many people, you know, I, I pass through the doors in the sky and now sort of every my year. Goodness. My goodness, I have no idea. Can't begin to imagine. So huh? I suppose with, with Zoom now, the things and, with Zoom. Yes. Well, I, I noticed one, and actually, I think one of the reasons why Zoom doesn't work for me is we can't hold hands on so. Mm -hmm. And one of the few times that it did work for me was when um, Kayla was teaching and she was in Mescaya. So the picture of the teacher had the building. So when she went around in the circle, I could, I could really almost feel it. Mm -hmm. So I, I liked that a lot because <laughs> often the teacher is just dancing in her living room and there's not a lot of room. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, well, I think that sounds follow your heart, follow your joy. And by doing that, everybody's uplifted. Yep. Yep. That sounds good. <laughs> I vote for that. <laughs> it's true. If everybody felt followed their joy, it would rub off on everyone, wouldn't it? Yep. So I yep. Think that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Jenny, for talking to me and um, inspiring people and uh, talking to dance wise that's brilliant thank you so much you're most welcome thank you. we've got a ps here <laughs> we've, we've, so we've, was, we've stopped recording and now we've started again <laughs> so i was thinking about marina bear's dance uh, it's called night walking it's choreographed to a piece of music by carlos nakai who's uh i'm actually i don't Ooh, know i love him i don't know what tribe he's from but he's definitely an indigenous flute player um, and, and she was, she had it on the tape deck on her car and she was driving through the Southwestern desert and the steps came to her. So I always feel like something like that isn't made up, it's channeled or however you want it. It's pulled out of the, I don't know, imaginal realm. Um, but you start, I think there's a drum beat, dum, dum, dum 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 heartbeat drum beat and so you start step 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 and you walk around the outside and you take eight steps then you take eight steps into the center raising Ashley I think it's your left arm then when you're in the center you tap with your left foot and step sideways Here. tap with your left foot and step sideways tap with your right foot and close tap step tap, close. And Marina said she learned that from the Hopi and it was called a ghost step, but it was for calling the ancestors. So you do that step, or I, you can call it eight times or four times. And then you back up again, lowering your arm and you turn to the right and start doing the circle. 
Well, when we do it at winter solstice in Neskaya, the building is completely dark. We turn during the first half of the dancing, we turn the lights down bit by bit. So it gets darker and darker until only the single candle is left burning in the middle of the floor. So then when we start night walking, our shadows taller than we are, are coming around the building. They're in, in a circle outside us because it's a circular building. So there they are. And when we walk into the center, they lean over us. Their shadows are right in the top of the building. So you definitely feel the presence of the ancestors. So um, I, I really like doing that dance at winter solstice. Oh, amazing. Having that result. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that again is another lovely note to end with, to, to know that the ancestors are always, their presence is always there. Yeah. And uh, our duty is to heal ourselves on this level so that the ancestors can then heal all the way up. Yep. So once again, I shall say thank you very much, Jenny. <laughs> and for that PS, and the, often the little PSs are the, there's <laughs> golden gold nuggets are there. Uh -huh. So uh, again, thank you so much. I'm delighted to have been <laughs> <able> to share. <laughs> okay. <laughs>